The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled New Therapies, New Hope, Evolving Strategies for Improving Outcomes and Quality of Life in Patients with Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash WKU860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to this webinar on evolving strategies for improving outcomes and quality of life in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My name is Perry Elliott. I work at University College in London. And I'm really pleased to be joined today by my, my colleague, Dr. Steve Oman from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester Hi, and Perry. Dr. Jacobo Olivotto in Florence. So welcome, guys. Good evening. And, and today we're going to be talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And Steve, perhaps if I can start with you, how, how do you define this condition? The most common definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the finding of left ventricular hypertrophy in the absence of any loading conditions that can cause that hypertrophy. And I also think that we want to exclude syndromic conditions that might also have LVH with it for our discussion today. But again, functionally, an echo or an MRI that shows a thick heart muscle and they don't have severe hypertension or severe aortic stenosis that can result in that degree of hypertrophy. Absolutely. So as you say, at one level, it's really straightforward, isn't it? A yeah. thick heart without aortic stenosis or hypertension, essentially. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, Jacobo, do you agree with that definition? Yes, I mean, there are two issues there. First of all, patients may develop disease, so they may have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to begin with and then develop renal disease or severe hypertension. And that should not rule out the disease if the phenotype is typical. On the other hand, there are a number of diseases which are usually rare, diseases other inherited errors of metabolism or storage disease that will present with systemic sort of symptoms and signs that may actually be very useful for an exact diagnosis and that they have a phenotype which is indistinguishable from sarcomeric HCM. Absolutely. So it's to be alert to those rare phenocopies because they have their own natural histories and, and often their own treatments. So, okay. So what we're talking about today is, is idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy or hypertrophy, which is caused by mutations in the genes that encode cardiac sarcomeric proteins. And so just to orient you a little bit, uh, we're just going to show you a short video on the pathophysiology of sarcomeric protein gene mutations. In HCM, there are too many connections or cross bridges between actin and myosin proteins, which increases the energy used by the heart and makes it harder for the muscle to relax. Okay, guys, so I, th I think we've got a sort of a, a good understanding of what it is we're dealing with, but what about how common this is? So Steve, what, how common do you think hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is? You know, we've been classically saying for years that the prevalence is approximately one in 500 around the world. There are different estimates to move up and down from there. And of course, it depends on, on the studies on which we rely on. Were they truly population-based studies? Were they people who were coming in for other reasons to have evaluations and gun image? But I, I think that the estimate around one in 500 is still our, our, our best estimate for, for what exists out there. Okay. Oh, Jakob, are you comfortable with that number, one in 500? It seems an awful lot of people. It is. Uh, and we know from study, from com community studies like Cardia study, for example, that if you actually screen the community looking for HCM, you will find one in 500, but five out of seven patients will have minimal or no symptoms, minimal hypertrophy, probably low risk, and uh, whereas only two will have a full-fledged disease. So if you look at the, for example, insurance uh, claim databases in the U.S., the actual number, the prevalence of people actually claiming and looking for medical assistance due to problems related to HCM uh, is only one in 3,500. Absolutely. I think this is, this is a really important point to make, isn't it? The majority of people who have unexplained thickening, as it were, are probably fine and probably remain fine for, for most of their lives. And the populations that we see in clinical practice, the, the frequency is probably much less than one in 500. I mean, we've recently done an electronic health record study in the UK, and we think it's about three to four per 10,000. But of course, these are the patients with symptoms presenting to it, their GP or to their, to their cardiologist. With that in mind, I mean, how, what is the natural history of this disease? So if we take that population that we see as, as cardiologists, what, what happens to people in the long term? I mean, Jacobo, what, what's your summary of the natural history? <laughs> 
Well, you know, from what we have seen, before, uh, just said, uh, many patients may actually live a very normal life with only minimal limitations or no symptoms and only be uh, found by chance as having the disease. Um, and in fact, in these individuals, uh, reassurance is an important part of management because they will be scared by what they read on the internet or what they are told by physicians that are not so comfortable with the disease. Of course, with time, there is a burden of disease that tends to climb. Patients usually become symptomatic around the age of 40, particularly if they have dynamic left ventricular outflow obstruction, uh, which is the main cause of severe symptoms at that age. And then with time, they may develop systolic dysfunction due to progressive fibrosis and refractory heart failure. Uh, only a small minority of patients will actually have life-threatening arrhythmias and sudden death is, has a rate of probably less than 1% per year, uh, which is very much different from what was reported in the early studies back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Steve, is that, is that the narrative that you have with your patients in the clinic? Yeah, it absolutely is. When you look at that one in 500 estimate, as you said, that is probably how many people have left ventricular hypertrophy. So I tell all my patients that uh, even though you have this now diagnosis, that doesn't mean your lifespan is necessarily shortened and you're much more likely to die from something else than your, H than your HCM. But we do have to watch out for some clinical features that we'll discuss uh, later on in our conversation today. Yeah. I mean, obviously the etiology is important in determining the, the outcome. Do you think that the genotype is of, of any relevance in, in predicting what happens to patients? I mean, Jacobo, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, generally not. Uh, we, we can't, if you have a single individual patient with a single individual genetic test result, it's, it's impossible to predict outcome. And it's a clinical judgment that you make based on your clinical findings. There are some exceptions as a general rule, for example, sarcomere positive patients. So patients with a positive test tend to have a worse outcome than patients with a gene negative sort of gene negative patients. And patients with double hits, double mutations, we will definitely have a worse prognosis. But apart from that, uh, it, it's really hard to predict anything about, and even in the same family with the same mutation and 99% of the same genotype, uh, it can be very variable in terms of phenotype and clinical history. Do you agree with that, Steve? I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's the sort of thing we've been saying for 20 years about genotype that you know, actually doesn't really help you in predicting outcomes in this disease. Do you think that's, that's true? I, I, I think it's true. I mean, I mean, what Jacopo said, I absolutely believe. So obviously having a, a sarcomeric variant on a whole has a, on average, worse outcomes than patients who have sarcomere negative uh, HCM. It, how does that translate into clinical practice? Well, do you follow that family a little closer? Do you screen their kids a little bit sooner perhaps? But in terms of counseling the patients, it, you really can't tell them that they can expect A, B, or C because they have a particular variant or don't have a variant. Yeah. Do you know, I'm starting to wonder whether we are being a bit pessimistic. I mean, I think <laughs> one, one of the problems we've had is we haven't really had sufficiently large scale genotyping to make real genotype phenotype correlations. And, and I think the more that we do, I think, I think there are certain patterns that are starting to emerge, um, particularly in relation to long-term development of heart failure, for example. So, so I haven't completely given up on the genotype for helping us in prediction, but but the problem is the genetic complexity, isn't it? We have many different mutations in a large number of different genes. Yeah, that really is a challenge with this compared to, to entities that are monogenetic in their, in their etiology. The fact that we have so many variants in different proteins uh, does make this a very confusing and statistically rigorous challenge for us. Absolutely. And I, I just wanted to maybe close this particular section um, about so, you know, a phrase I don't really like very much, but real world practice. Uh, a lot of the natural history studies that we quote and that we've contributed to, these all come from large tertiary centers you know, with expertise in the disease. Do you think that what we see reflects what happens in, in the so-called real world? Steve? I, I think that's a great question. And I'd also dislike that term because it implies that you don't practice in the real world. And, yeah. and, but, but, there are, but there are real issues with that. So on, on the one hand, um, in the real world or outside of academic medical centers, there are some procedures that are done at low volumes that have worse outcomes when they're, than when they're performed at uh, high volume centers that see a lot of HCM patients. 
On the other hand, as uh, implied by our prior conversation, there are a lot of patients who have minimal or no symptoms that never make it to an academic medical center. Or they're simply being followed in primary care practices in the real world and have great outcomes because they have that, that end of the spectrum of HCM. So I think you hit both ends of the, of the challenge, but I'm, I'm not sure that in... Uh, my case, I you know work at, in Rochester, Minnesota, but we're also the primary cardiology center for the 33 surrounding counties. Mm. Um, so it's not like we're isolated and only academic here. So I, I think you can get really mired down in the details, and and but it's not black and white. Yeah, Jacob, would you say would you agree with that, or do you think that patients should be seen in reasonably high volume centers with some expertise? Um, I mean, provided they get competent answer, because it, it depends on how competent people are and how much the news spread around. HCM, when we started in the business, was really an exotic diagnosis. Now it is common, and now we're looking for the rare diseases like Fabry, and th those are exotic. So HCM, I think that most cardiologists should have some basic sort of knowledge and, and know how to treat the simple cases. I think that where the, uh, the census of excellence really come into, into play is when you have to, have to make any hard decision about implanting a device or performing, particularly when performing a procedure, because that is when uh, centers of excellence really make a difference. Okay, great. So, so I think we, we've agreed this is a relatively common condition for, for many, if not most people, it's relatively benign, at least in the short to medium term. But the, 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 there is a, a group of patients with uh, a more uh, malignant outcome, sudden death, yes, but actually in the long term, the major problems, heart failure, atrial fibrillation. So I think that sets us up well for, for our next discussion on the management of patients with symptoms. Okay, guys, so, so what we'd like to do now is to move on to the to the diagnosis of this condition. And I, as a starting point, I thought it would be useful to take a, a real patient. So I've got a, a woman here, 45 years of age, who presents uh, to her general practitioner having blacked out whilst running. And actually on closer questioning, it's, it's, been, it's quite apparent that she's had symptoms going back a number of years with progressive breathlessness going up a uh, couple of flights of stairs, some dizziness on exertion and occasional palpitations with atypical chest pain. So obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're three hocomologists here, so I'm not suggesting we go completely off piste and consider <laughs> what the diagnosis might be, but what, what would you do next? If, if you've been referred a patient like this, what's, what's the next step, Steve, if you'd like to well, kick us off? Well, my, my mentor, Rick Nursemura, always told me I should talk to the patient first and right. then probably do a physical examination before I jump to any other testing. So, I mean, the history of syncope is obviously critical for so many diseases, and in particular in HCM, because they can be postural faints or vasovagal faints, which need some treatment, but aren't having any implied bigger risk versus something we think might be arrhythmic in nature, which is more serious and has broad, broader spectrum uh, implications. So I think we need to really take a strong syncope history. And then, as you say, delve into some of these other issues with, do they, are they having shortness of breath, the anginal symptoms, et cetera, as, as they go on. So first step is, is uh, thorough history so that you and the patient are comfortable, you understand each other. And the next is to do a physical examination and, and see if it's compatible with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, yeah, Jacob, what, what are the other key elements of the history that you elicit in the clinic? So family history is usually extremely important because you will often have a history of sudden death or premature uh, manifestations. For example, I saw a patient today that had no family history of HCM, but the mother had been treated for atrial fibrillation since the age of 40. Mm. So those are things that should be investigated and it's not easy to get a proper family history, but when you do, it's really rewarding. Um, and the other things is ask for particular uh, sort of manifestations, even patients who are asymptomatic, so, so to say, for example, we'll often have symptoms after large meals or ingestion of alcohol, which is quite specific for obstruction. So there are key questions that you may ask that may help you. In this regard yeah, that's great and do, do you still examine patients absolutely yes i i believe you uh, <laughs> but but i think it's uh, of all the conditions that yeah for which physical examination was made for i think obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is probably it um and steve i mean perhaps we're just reflecting the uh, uh, generation but do you, do you think it brings something to the table before you go to the 
you know, the very powerful tools we have for, for making diagnosis now? Well, I think it does both before and after those other diagnostic right. tools. So again, sometimes in a referral practice, they might have had their echocardiogram before they see you, but the physical examination is important uh, because it can help confirm echo findings uh, or suggest you need to look further. So this is maybe too far in the weeds, but when if someone has an echocardiogram before they see you and they have left ventricular hypertrophy, but no outflow tract obstructions identified, well, remember that patient is, is laying down when that exam is going on. So their preload is maximized, which minimizes their chance for outflow tract obstruction. When you examine a patient, you have the ability to have them sitting, standing, or squat to stands where you can elicit these very dynamic murmurs uh, that you talked about. And, and when I'm teaching residents and fellows, you know, I, I, I tell them that, you know, in medical school, you were taught about how all kinds of different murmurs change in intensity or duration. The one that really changes is yes. the murmur of dynamic outflow tract obstruction. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's that dynamic nature of the, I mean, yeah. for, for me, it's, uh, I like the way you, you phrased it. We can, we're confirming the echo findings. Well, yep. I think the echo findings confirm the physical examination. And, and for me, it's the mismatch. When there's a mismatch, yes. you have to find Absolutely. the explanation, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's right. If if the clinical history and examination and the initial testing imaging don't match, then you need to go further. If they do match, then you've got, got concordance and you can begin down a, a treatment uh, pathway for that individual patient. Absolutely. Of course, we shouldn't be forgetting the ECG because that is there's a, a renaissance of ECGs in, in cardiomyopathies. But before you go to echo, uh, it, the, the rule to remember is that it's quite uncommon to have a normal ECG in HCM. Only about 10% of patients, this is a, these are Mayo data, uh, only 10% of patients will have normal ECGs. And when they do, it's a very mild phenotype. So it's very strong. And, and, and ECG is extremely, although there are no specific signs, 100% specific signs for HCM, if you have a VH, if you have a Q wave in the few leads, and if you have an inverted T wave on the high lateral leads, that is quite suggestive. And even in family screenings, the ECG is known to be more sensitive than echo. Absolutely. And, and often when the echo is normal, I mean, if you have an abnormal ECG, you're, the chances that you're going to go on as a relative to develop the disease is actually pretty high. So it's, I think it's, it's a very sensitive test of early disease. And of course, there may be also be some red flags on the ECG as well. I mean, if you have conduction disease, it may take you down a very particular pathway in, in seeking some of the, the rarer phenocopies. Okay, so we've, we've examined the patient, and we've done our electrocardiogram, and in this particular case, we've got some evidence for left ventricular hypertrophy, some ST segment change. Um, first point of call would be an echocardiogram. Would we agree on that? Or would we go straight to an MRI? No, I, th I think the echocardiogram is still the, the main diagnostic uh, tool for patients with HCM uh, for identifying hypertrophy and the pathophysiology for both obstructive and non-obstructive patients. Yeah. And so, Steve, I'm showing you this, this echo here in this young woman. What, what's your interpretation of this echo? Well, you can see that there is some septal hypertrophy at the base and even extending into the mid ventricle uh, in that parasternal long axis view with some systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. There is a little bit of uh, turbulence in the outflow tract with the color flow and a little bit of a posterior jet of mitral regurgitation. So you're suspicious of HCM with some degree of outflow tract obstruction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the mitral regurgitation, I mean, Steve's very you know, eruditely said posteriorly directed jet. Is, is, that, in, is that important? It is important. For, first of all, uh, many cardiologists don't know this, but the valves, the mitral valve in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is not normal. It's mm. an elongated valve. And it, although it's not mix, uh, mixed mitral valve, it's a, it's a normal looking valve, but it's really elongated. And that is, and the, the subaortic, uh, the subvalvular apparatus is usually abnormal. Sometimes you have direct insertion of the papillary muscles or very short cordae. And the degree of mitral regurgitation is also extremely variable. You sometimes elicit the full spectrum only with exercise. So exercise echo is, is very important to um, find out why the patient is so symptomatic and why the atrium is so dilated, for example. Right. Now, the other thing I would add to that is that that jet can tell you whether you need to look further at this patient. So Absolutely. if you do truly demonstrate outflow tract obstruction in the re remainder of the echo study and they have a high gradient and you see this posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation, you can be fairly certain there isn't other primary organic disease of the mitral valve. Mm. 
But if there's a central jet or an anteriorly directed jet, well, then you have to be wondering, is there something wrong with the posterior leaflet as well as the anterior leaflet? And is there primary mitral valve disease in addition to their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So again, it, it's not a 100% thing, but it, it, it gives you some pretest probabilities of whether you need to do more investigation of the mitral apparatus. Absolutely. This is so important, isn't it? Because uh, as Jacob has said, the, the mitral valve is not normal in this disease. Right. And uh, if you've got you know, a prolapsing cusp of one of the leaflets, or if you've got accessory connections between the anterior leaflet and the septum, or a really abnormal papillary muscle with direct insertion, this is all about anatomy. This, this is stuff which can't be corrected with medication. So it's, it's right. really important to assess the mitral valve uh, to, to, de to define your subsequent treatment strategy, I think. That's right. Um, so this young woman, when we interrogated her, her outflow tract using continuous, continuous wave Doppler, she's got a gradient maybe of a couple of meters per second, something like that. So non-obstructive disease, Jacobo, would you be happy to stop there? No, if the symptoms are reproducible and particularly on, and during hot weather or after meals, that's very suggestive. Uh, many patients have to be careful in what they eat in the evenings because they are so afraid of getting angina or shortness of breath. And particularly if you have a large atrium, which you cannot explain otherwise, all these elements point to dynamic obstruction. So if you don't see it at rest, you should definitely exercise the patients and assess during exercise. So before exercise, I mean, Steve, would you do anything by the bedside in the echo lab? Yeah, we, we do. We have, a, we have a standardized protocol for anyone who is referred with a diagnosis or possible diagnosis of HCM. So they will get a gradient assessment at rest and if it's not more than about 50 millimeters of mercury, then the sonographer will automatically do a series of valve maneuvers with the patient. Uh, and if that still doesn't elicit a gradient of more than 40 to 50, then we'll sometimes have the patients do squat to stand maneuvers in the echo lab uh, and image them in an upright position. Occasionally, we still use amyl nitride inhalation, although that's more and more difficult to come by. But we, mm -hmm. we do have that standard protocol within our resting echo for a referral of, of HCM patient to, to do some basic provocation. If we still don't have a gradient at that point, then it does come back to the, to the managing clinician. So if I'm seeing the patient and they come back and they were, couldn't find a gradient on that study, if that patient's having class three symptoms, uh, then I have to do more. And that's, that's a great time for an exercise echocardiogram, or in some cases you end up doing a hemodynamic catheterization to, to do that next level of assessment. If they're completely asymptomatic, it might not be as imperative, although academically or for understanding the patient's other treatment options, sometimes it is still good to document whether they can be provoked to a higher gradient. Absolutely, no, great, great points. Okay, so we've, we've taken our history, we've got an abnormal ECG, we've got a provoked gradient, in this case with Valsalva maneuver. Would you do any further tests, Jacobo? Well, at this point, you, I would definitely um, look for arrhythmias. You screen for arrhythmias, which you would in any patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, irrespective of their phenotype. So you look for spontaneous you know, uh, propensity to ventricular arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation by whole tube monitoring. It's usually a 48 hour, it's recommended by the European guidelines. And then of course, you would think about advanced imaging uh, uh, such as uh, cardiac MRI. This has now become like a sort of a standard. So you don't really ask the question, why should you do it? But you, probably you should, because we are, we are doing it and not really sometimes asking the questions we would like to have answered, just do it for the sake of it. But why do we do MRI? We do MRIs either because the diagnosis is not quite evident because the acoustic window is not the greatest, particularly in apical forms uh, with very pathological ECGs. We do MRIs because we want to define the distribution and the anatomic abnormalities before surgery. We do MRI because we want tissue characterization, which may help to rule out rare diseases like Fabry or what everybody's going for now is assessing fibrosis. Uh, this is not, should not be the only goal, but it's definitely one of the most important because it does tell you what sort of path the, the disease is so taking. Yeah. Steve, is MRI part of your standard protocol now? Yeah, all of our patients are actually scheduled for MRI, but if we do get all of the information we need from the echocardiogram and, and SCD risk stratification is complete one way or another, then sometimes we don't, we don't do the MR in those situations. But if the SCD risk is not fully established or if there is inadequate imaging of the apex and we're wondering about an apical aneurysm or, or those types of things, as, as Jacopo said, then, then we do get it. 
Yeah. Do either of you do exercise tests? We do exercise tests on a lot of our patients, um, often to establish a baseline. Uh, so when they come back in the future, we have that to compare to. But the other issue uh, is really just establishing uh, whether patients are having uh, cardiac output deficits that you can assess using cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, and particularly as our society has gotten more and more sedentary, uh, some people don't really know if they're symptomatic or not because they don't really stress their systems. And so to do this just gives us more insight into how much impact their HCM may be having. Echo, do you, yeah, you do? I mean, we, we love exercise echo in patients who are uh, fit or have, you know, don't, don't have severe disease. Even when they're obstructed, we do exercise in the team on echo because we get so much information about their, you know, systolic function and reserve and muscular regurgitation, pulmonary um, hypertension and diastolic reserve. However, uh, we prefer to have cardiopulmonary testing in two settings. One is pre-transplant or in the sort of patient going towards end stage, just to, to make sure we don't miss the train for transplant referral. The other is we started to do this in the really active patients who want to exercise in order to prescribe sort of tailored exercise program and sports. And this is a, I think the new frontier for many patients. You know, the, yeah. the, the other thing we find useful is when you do have someone who is symptomatic uh, and perhaps they're on some medications, if they have, if they're limited in their cardiopulmonary performance, but the primary reason is their heart rate is so horribly suppressed, well, then maybe that tells you that they're on too much of an agent, so, say, for instance, a beta blocker or something that allows you to fine tune their medications that way. So it's not just exercise for duration, but there's a lot of other information you can get from those studies, as Jacopo said. But yeah. Perry, I did, you didn't answer. Are you routinely doing a stress test? Uh, yeah, team? I mean, we've sort of got a little bit out of the habit. And I tried to set a trap for you both, and neither of you fell into it, which is so thank you. But um, we, in this particular case, we did do a, a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And her exercise capacity is 90% of her predicted value. And the reason I wanted to show this was because I think sometimes the exercise test is used as a, as a reason to intervene. So, or there's an expectation that if you've got severe obstruction, you're going to have a low VO2. Now, the next part of our conversation when we talk about new therapies is going to be really interesting in this regard. But I just wanted to make the point that you can have severe exertional symptoms and a really big gradient. And yet your cardiopulmonary exercise test shows a reasonable peak oxygen consumption. So I think there are many other reasons to do an exercise test. And you've both given you know, at least five or six really good reasons. You know, sometimes an ad, you're looking for the adverse consequences of giving a beta blocker, for example, or helping you in differential diagnosis, or is the patient approaching end-stage heart failure. But, but I personally wouldn't use this as part of my routine evaluation for, for example, should I do a myectomy in this patient? Right. Do you agree? Yes, it's, it's certainly a clinical judgment based on symptoms, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, well, I, I think the challenge too, you, you get you get the obese patient who also has outflow tract yeah. obstruction and they're short yeah. of breath. And yeah. if their cardiopulmonary performance is pretty good, well, then you're going to lean towards, let's treat your, your lifestyle and your obesity as our primary thing. But if, they're, if their cardiopulmonary performance is in the tank, well, then you know you've got to be more aggressive with their cardiac management. Absolutely. Yeah, the other thing that may be useful, and the only the only time it's been useful to, to me for the side about a myectomy, for example, is if you document hemodynamic instability. So mm -hmm. if you see somebody with a gradient going up and the pressure going down at peak exercise, that's worrying enough for me to sort of make make up my mind if I'm not convinced. Absolutely. It's too. Great. So guys, I think great discussion. So you know, from a relatively small number of slides, I think a really you know a demonstration of how. This is a complex process, the evaluation of symptoms in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if you do it in a systematic way, you can get a pretty good understanding of the mechanism of the symptoms. And to set up the next part of our discussion, what one should be targeting in trying to improve their exercise capacity and quality of life. So thank you. Okay, gentlemen, so we've, we've spoken about the diagnosis uh, and the assessment of outflow tract obstruction in particular. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, about therapies. So, uh, Jakob, what, what are the basic principles behind treating obstructive disease us, using the case that we discussed in, in the previous example? So first and foremost is treating the symptoms. You want patients to feel better, 
there are definitely some lifestyle advice you can give, like ingesting fluids, avoiding exercising after meals, avoiding large ingestion of alcohol, and avoiding isometric sort of strain. Uh, but obviously, this will not often be sufficient. So we have traditionally used negative inotrope agents in the, to sort of reduce contraction in, in, of the left ventricle and uh, try to reduce the gradients as a result of that. Uh, so uh, the, the first agent that has shown effect, that because thanks to Braunwald and, and Weigel in the 70s, are the beta, are beta blockers. I still think beta blockers have a role. Uh, they are now undergoing sort of some sort of revisitation re judgment, but I still think that wisely used, they often make patients feel better if used cautiously. Sometimes they will cause chronotropic incompetence and side effects. Mm -hmm. Some people will not be able to tolerate it. The problem is that they may be effective in sort of exercise induced label obstruction, but not in the uh, sort of resting obstruction of severe, gray, uh, of severe um, degree. So you may switch to non didropinidinic calcium antagonists such as verapamil or bilitiazem. In my experience, they don't work very well. And it's beta blockers tend to be better in my personal experience. But of course, then again, if you have fixed, uh, if you have resting obstruction that is severe and symptoms persist, then, and, and often they do persist to some degree, uh, the classic sort of second line therapy is disapiramide. It's an old drug, it's a, an antiarrhythmic agent used because of the negative anotropic action. We know it's safe, but it has side effects, particularly anticholinergic side effects, and it tends to have tachyphylaxis. And again, uh, a, a fair share, I would say more than uh, the majority of patients who are on it will eventually need to proceed to some kind of intervention because the long-term effects will not be sufficient to control gradients and symptoms. Okay. So Steve, I mean, you, know, you recently chaired the HA guideline for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think what Jacobo has, has given us is the sort of the standard mantra for the pharmacolo pharmacological treatment for alpha tract obstruction. So presumably you agree with that in general principle, but do you, <laughs> but in terms of its application in everyday practice, I mean, do you, do you think it's it's straightforward to start with a beta blocker add a pyramide or is, is are there other things to consider yeah I, I i agree with what jacopo said i think there's a couple of things i would add to that so first of all remember that all these agents the goal of them is to reduce symptoms so if you do have that patient who's asymptomatic we shouldn't feel obligated to start them on a medication just because right. they have the diagnosis there's no long-term benefit that's been proven to putting someone on a beta blocker mm. or a calcium channel blocker. So an asymptomatic patient can simply be followed. The other thing I would add is, is also look at their medications for things that might be provoking their outflow tract obstruction. For patients who have mild concomitant hypertension, sometimes they're put on vasodilator therapy. Well, changing them from a pure vasodilator to one of the agents that, that Jacopo mentioned can tremendously improve symptom status for some patients just with that simple swap out of medications. So I think, I think those are a couple of features. And, 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 I, and I agree uh, that each patient is going to have a different response or different side effect profile to those agents. And if someone starts on a beta blocker and they get better in terms of their outflow tract gradient and its symptoms, but the side effects become as arduous as the original symptoms, then sometimes there is a lot of success switching over to calcium channel blockers because the symptom or the side effect profile is better for a lot of patients. So it, it is a lot of trial and error with patients going back and forth between those. And then for me, when I get to, I've tried beta blockers and or calcium channel blockers. For me, the next step is, do we need to advance their therapy? Are they still symptomatic? It's not an echo diagnosis, it's a symptom diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Do they need to go to advanced therapies, which include disapiramide or septal reduction therapies is, is how my mental algorithm works for treating patients. Yeah, I, I agree with you both. I mean, I, I, from my experience, beta blockers, if they, if they work at all, it tends to be in those patients who have the really big provocable gradients. Yep. Yeah, you know, they go from 20 to 120 when they walk up yep. a few stairs. Beta blockers in that set of circumstance, I think, work often quite well. But for the patients who've got sort of a relatively fixed gradient around 80, 90, it, it very rarely comes down very much with a beta blocker, uh, uh, unless you use really high doses, at which time the patient gets all the usual beta blocker side effects. Yeah. Um, and disapyramide, similarly, I think in those provocables, it can be very effective. Um, but the side effects are 
genuinely really quite limiting, particularly in the older patients, I think, you know, the dry mouth, dry eyes, the yeah. interference with urination, constipation. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a dirty drug in that sense. And you've also got this, this curious thing, this tachyphylaxis that you see with, with dizapyramide. I mean, I, I've stopped telling patients about it just in case I was suggesting that, <laughs> that it might happen, but, it, but I'm, I'm sure you've both had the experience after about 12 months or so, it, it just seems to wear off. Yeah. And the other challenge is that it's a three times a day medication, which yeah. patients find an imposition on their lifestyle. So, yeah, it's also increasingly difficult to get hold of, actually. I don't know what it's Absolutely, yes. Good. Entire countries don't have it available and it's getting harder to find. Yeah. So, so we, so the case that we discussed um, in part two, so this young woman, 45 years of age, gradient, you know, let's say around 100 on, on provocation. She's been tried on a beta blocker, didn't really make much difference, was intolerant to disapyramide. What, what's the next step? Ya Yako, what would you be counselling this patient now? Well, at this point, you, you definitely have to go for, for something invasive. You have to go for uh, a surgical myectomy, uh, which is a quite an elegant procedure in the sense that it's, it's a sort of a clean intervention. It doesn't leave prosthesis, doesn't require lifelong anticoagulation. And if, it, if, if well performed, can really do the trick forever. Right? Basically, it doesn't. Um, otherwise, if, if the patient is not willing or if surgical risk is high or if there is no surgeon available who has the experience, because that's also quite often the case in many countries, then uh, several centers have developed expertise in alcohol septal ablation, which is a percutaneous procedure that ablates the septum, uh, hopefully in the, in the point of contact with the mitral valve, and may be uh, effective, very effective, and uh, in, in good hands, equally safe in uh, sort of reducing symptoms. Although the gradient reduction is never as radical as you have with surgery. It's really, usually there is some sort of residual SAM and gradient, but the, um, the symptomatic outcome is usually good. Right. So Steve, this is, this is an unfair question, but hey, um, so yeah, the, 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 guy, the guy from Mayo, I'm going to ask you what you think the unmet need is really, because you know, you're, you're in a center that has you know, high volume myectomy practice, really good results. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? We try beta blocker dizapyramide. If that doesn't work, we just do a myectomy. So is, is there any need to have, have a further discussion? Yeah, I, I think there is. It's, it's a great question and a, and a great, a great pot, prod for me. So, so the reality is, uh, as there are strong data that show that the success and low complication rates uh, are optimized at some truly high volume centers. And those high volume centers aren't ubiquitous. And to train surgeons to do this procedure is challenging. It's a, it's a difficult visualization to do an operation. For those of you who don't know, the operation is performed through an incision in the ascending aorta. And then the surgeon operates through the aortic valve. So there's really one person who can see and feel what's going on during a myectomy. Once a surgeon learns the craftsmanship of doing that, as Jacobo said, it's really an elegant solution that is fully customized to the patient uh, each patient that's having a myectomy, but it's, it's hard to train people. So there is a gap in training and there's a gap in availability of, of those truly skilled surgeons. And so we, we do need to have options for patients who are have drug refractory symptoms due to their outflow tract obstruction. So Jakob, would, would you like to tell us about um, some of the exciting news about new therapeutic options for patients with outflow tract obstruction? Thanks, Barry. These are indeed exciting times. We are now uh, on the verge of uh, using our new class of, of drugs called uh, myosin inhibitors or allosteric myosin inhibitors. But these drugs, these are small uh, molecules which are orally available and bind selectively to the cardiac myosin, reducing it, their affinity, this affinity to actin. So in fact, reducing contractility, reducing the number of myosin involved in contraction at the given, given sort of cardiac cycle. And by doing so, they reduce the hypercontractility, which is at the core of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and several of the downstream consequences of such um, abnormality. Great, thanks, Jacob. So, so maybe just to illustrate those points a little bit more, we'll just, we'll just show the audience a short movie just to, again, illustrate the mechanism of this new class of drugs. Mavacamptin targets the underlying mechanism of HCM, 
by inhibiting and therefore reducing the number of actin-myosin cross bridges. So Jakob, so the you know, mavocamptin has recently um, been tested in a, in a randomized trial at Explorer HCM. Do you want to maybe just quickly describe the design of that trial and, and the endpoints? So uh, Explorer HCM was a uh, randomized uh, multi-center international um, phase three trial, which randomized 251 patients uh, to um, mavocamptin or placebo on a one-to-one -one basis. Patients were enrolled based on a diagnosis of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uh, obstruction. They had to have a gradient of at least 50 millimeters of mercury at rest or with exercise. They were allowed to keep their background therapy with beta blockers or calcium antagonists, but not disuperamide. They were uh, screened and titrated with mavocamptin uh, or placebo and followed for 30 weeks and then evaluated at the end and compared to baseline in terms of their functional capacity VO2 consumption and NYHA class improvement as a primary endpoint. A combination of these two elements were the primary endpoint. And there were a number of secondary endpoints, including improvements in uh, NYHA class, gradient reduction, and uh, improvement in quality of life assessed by several tools. Great, thanks. So Steve, I mean, coming up with endpoints for, for trials in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is challenging because yeah, the conventional trial design is built around hard endpoints. Yeah. So the, the, the endpoints that were chosen for the Explorer trial, what, what do you think of them? Do you think they're relevant to patients? Do you think they're a good indicator of the effect of Mavocampton? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, as you point out, it's hard in a, in a short trial to get to a mortality endpoint, particularly in HCM where the mortality rates are, are excellent to show any improvement. But what patients care about is their symptom improvement. And, and the design of this study included both objective measurements, VO2, and subjective measurements. How does the patient feel as judged uh, according to the NYHA classification scheme? And having a pre-specified endpoint that included both an improvement in VO2 and an improvement in the way the patient felt, I thought was a very uh, valid way to show that this was directionally in the right range. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've said many times in private and in public, I was surprised by the peak VO2. It worried me because I think it's actually quite hard to get an increase in your VO2 in, in intervention studies. I agree with the NYHA class for me is, is what we do in the clinic, but it's not a robust measure, at least not seen as a robust measure for trial design. But Jacobo, I mean, if maybe if you want to just give us the headlines, I mean, we saw really quite dramatic improvements. Yeah, so the primary endpoint was, was met by about 40% of the patients. So that may be high or low, depending on how you see it, but it was highly significant. The, the thing is that the design of the trial had to be uh, and it had to be to please the registration and the, 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 the FDA, basically. So we couldn't really go for the usual measures we would use to judge, for example, myectomy or that we have used for procedures or, or drugs in the past. These, those were all secondary endpoints because you had to have a, an objective sort of primary endpoint. Secondary endpoints were all met to a much higher sort of degree of significance, including gradient reduction and even quality of life. Kansas City questionnaire had an improvement of nine points, which is very, very high compared to the average pharmacological trial. So on average, I think if you consider the, what is really used in the clinic as a measure, as a, as a rule of thumb to, to judge the efficacy of the drug, um, I think that the primary endpoint underestimates the actual benefit of the drug in terms of, particularly in terms of symptomatic improvement, which is really what we are looking for in, in sort of short trials in these kind of patients. Yeah, I completely agree with you. For me, it was the it was the concordance across a range of different functional measures and, and symptomatic measures for the patients. So yes, the gradient came down. That's, of course, good, because that was the target for the trial. But the fact that NYHA class improved, the VO2 improved, the BMP came down, that even the troponin came down. You know, I think that it's all concordant with actually a quite really quite an important effect. Um, so, so Steve, I mean, there's, I was talking to my surgery, surgical colleagues yesterday and they're all getting a bit worried. So we, uh, is surgery at an end now? Are we, do we just give patients Mavocampton or Aficampton? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice provocative question. So, I, so the answer <laughs> to me is short and simple and it's no, I don't think this is the end of surgery. So, and so I, I think that we're, and, and we also don't know, 
long, long-term safety. This is a 30-week trial. And, and when we're talking about treating 30 to 40 to 50-year-olds who have highly symptomatic things, so we're talking about lifelong therapy, we, we don't yet have history with that. And then uh, we'll probably talk to it ab about this. So th there was a, a, a troubling aspect of this trial in that about 10% of patients dropped their ejection fraction to less than 50%. Fortunately, it's temporary, so it returns to normal wh when the agent is stopped. But, but that drop in EF uh, is, is a troubling concern that we have to, we'll have to wrestle with in trying to find the best place in therapy for this. Yeah, so as you say, I mean, it's by the nature of its action, monitoring the ejection fraction is important part of the initiation and, and administration of this drug in the short to medium term. But, but at your point, I mean, for, for I, what I'm telling my surgical colleagues is actually, I think we're going to get more business, not less. Yeah. And, and Jacobo, your, your reflections on the, on, the, on the findings, I mean, the, the changes were dramatic, but it's still, you know, maybe 30 to 40% of patients respond, but the rest didn't. And that shouldn't really be a surprise, should it? You know, when you think about the kind of issues we were talking about, the complexity of this disease, the involvement of the mitral valve, is it a surprise that not everybody responds? Not really. As you say, it's probably some, sometimes it's really anatomic and geometrical and, mm. and not only functional. So I think it, it, the, these drugs are going to teach us a lot more on, about how to use surgery properly. It's going to teach us how to intervene and sort of maybe new strategies. And I think that the patients that will go to the surgeon will be really much better sort of selected because of this. The Valor study has just been um, completed and it's a positive trial. The trial, the Valor HCM trial was a trial trying to find whether, to ascertain whether Mavacantin might postpone or reduce the needs for surgery in surgical candidates with obstructive hypertrophic adenopathy. So there will be probably a reduction of the volume of surgery in patients that have purely functional uh, sort of problems, but there definitely will be a lot of room for surgical interventions and in, in, in all the rest. Yeah. I, as you say, I think that the important thing is, I think this will shine a, a, new, a refreshing light back on the problem of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and obstruction. Hopefully patients will get better assessment and better tailored therapy, which will include myectomy. Um, but I, I think it's getting the right treatment for the right patient. I think that, that for me is, is the, is the perhaps an unintended benefit of, of these kind of studies. Yeah, I mean, so, there are other issues, for I example. Think, th oh, go ahead, Jacopo. Yeah. Well, for example, there are patients that, you know, are, for example, in, in permanent atrial fibrillation, still have some SAM, severe diastolic dysfunction. You, you wonder whether they will actually benefit from a myectomy at all because they're, they have severe diastolic dysfunction as well. So that, you know, and other, I mean, I think in some cases, having a, a, a negative anotrope that works in, as a bridge, just to, to, to understand further how much patients can benefit from surgery, uh, may be equally effective and important. Yeah. Well, yeah I, I, I was going to say, based on Jacopo's statement before, and I've been saying this to, to other colleagues, so there's two pathophysiologic mechanisms here. One of them is at the macroanatomic level, which is the mechanical problem, and one of them is at the cellular or functional level. And trying to sort out which one of those is predominant for a patient may help us identify which pathway yeah. is the better, better pathway. Is it going to be pharmacologic or is it going to be uh, surgical? And maybe some patients need both. Yeah. Guys, the, the one thing I've learned from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and I'm sure you have over the years, is there, there are no rules. And I think you know, there's no such thing as a typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. So I think you know, tailoring the therapy with what with the range of options we have, and we now have some new options as well, I think is, is always the critical thing. So thank you. I think it's been a, I think it's been a really great discussion and I, and I hope really informative for the audience. So there is genuinely new hope, I think, for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you know, in terms of treating their symptoms and preventing disease-related complications. There's a great deal we can do as long as we take a systematic approach to the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash WKU860. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb. This activity is certified by the University of Florida College of Medicine. This activity is developed in collaboration with our educational partner, PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education.